evening. And um, certainly the storms have started to die down a little bit near me, so, but I hope you're all well and safe and comfortable where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Dr Anna Byron, and I'm really delighted to be join, joining um, some really wonderful guests this evening to this uh, middle free and maternity hour, uh, where we'll be focusing on personalised care and working together really important for ensuring that we move together collectively to support safe care for all, safe and personalised care. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our two guests, two presenters this evening. We've got the wonderful Dr Claire Feely and we've got Becky Westbury joining us. Um, so hi, hi to you both. Hi. hi. It's wonderful to be with you both and thank you for taking time to be together to discuss these important issues and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I thought it'd be nice to start with a little overview of things that have been impacting everybody, things that we're all facing and continue to face together as a collective and then to find out a little bit about how your week's going. So I know that for many of us, we've been facing so much and continue to face so much because of the pandemic. We're still facing the impact of that, both personally and professionally. And I know our services, maternity services, are in a restoration phase and still responding to those pressures and strains that have been put on us all. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody that's working so hard clinically, uh, working to support families. And so, you know, it's really wonderful that we have been able to, um, you know, receive updates and speak together and share midwifery and maternity care issues, use it through these maternity and midwifery hours. Um, so it's really wonderful that we can be here tonight to talk about issues that are impacting on midwives, maternity care workers and maternity services and therefore families. Um, obviously, we've also then had the challenges of the storms that have been sort of rampaging their way through our country as well. And, you know, I hope that everybody is managing to stay safe. I know that it has also had a big impact on people. And it creates, it sort of almost feels like there's a resonant turbulence that's come from that, like a physical turbulence that's had an impact on us. But I think amidst the storms and the pressures that we're facing, there, there is so much to be hopeful for and, and with. And for me, some of that solace has come from hearing news and updates on things that are happening that are going to be responding to the issues that we're facing. And, it's been wonderful to receive the uh, our chief midwife's bulletins regularly, giving like an overview, you know, Jackie, Jacqueline Dunkley bents overviews that you're able to read about what's happening, what things are coming out to support us in our practice and work. Um, and I, I know at the latest bulletin, she shared the importance of personalised uh, and safe care and the, the work that's being done and the continued work that's needed to sustain the outcomes that we have available. Um, you know, we've got to continue to look for quality, safe maternity care and be continuously looking for ways to improve practice and to improve safety. And it was really good to see at the, 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 the the lead of the bulletin was talking about and focusing on safe and personalized care um, and our need to continue to work to ensure those sustained improvements. But it was also, in, it was definitely heartening to see that we are making headway and all of the important work around reducing stillbirth rates to support families to have improved outcomes. It's, it's wonderful to read those, the, the data and to hear that we are making those improvements um, in that area and, and we need to continue to, to work with the same approach and the same a collaborative approach to making those improvements as a team. It's also really heartening to read about the work happening around the country and beyond to support our midwifery workforce retention, recovery and developments. And it's fantastic to see how midwives and families are coming together, women, birthing people and families are coming together with, through the March with Midwives campaign to really um, press and push for those 
improvements and to ensure safety, not just for families, but also for everybody working and being cared for in maternity services. And it was really lovely last week, um, the RCM and Cheryl Samuels and some student midwives were able to deliver the um, petition that Cheryl Samuels started. And it was really, really fantastic to see that that was submitted at 10 Downing Street. Um, again, to promote and support the importance of um, strengthening our midwifery workforce. So I'd, I'd love to now just sort of say a special and warm hello to Dr. Claire Feely and Becky Westbury, and just to sort of hear a little bit from you both about how your week's been going. And one of the conventions of the midwifery hour is that we ask you, you know, what's been a highlight for you this week? So I just thought it'd be nice to come to Becky and ask you how, how your week's been going. Hi, Anna. Um, yeah, it's it's been a great week. I think um, perhaps the highlight for me has been I had two weeks annual leave prior to this week and I had a great time, caught up with friends, um, really switched off from work. Um, but a highlight this week has actually been going back to work um, and, you know, seeing the team again and um yeah getting back into clinical care so yeah that's that's my week so far I think I heard you picked up an extra shift as well this week had you <laughs> yeah I did an extra shift today um to help out because they were short um because of sickness but yeah I've had a great day <laughs> oh how wonderful and thank you then for making time to be here too Becky it's wonderful to be with you and um, hi Claire how are you getting on how's your week going my week has been good. I'm still uh, acclimatising to my new job, working out what's what. Uh, but I've had the pleasure this week of exploring eye poetry. So for any methodologists out there, I've actually been giving it a dabble and a bit of a, a go. Thanks to Gemma McKenzie giving me a little bit of a steer in the right direction. So thanks, Gemma, if you're watching this. Um, wow. I'm not sure if they're going to be any good to share with the wide audience later on, but it's definitely been nice to have a play and and get back to data, you know, actually immersing back into data. So yeah. And have you have you been writing poetry or have you been just reading other people's poems? So I poetry is a form of data analysis from qualitative data. So you pull out chunks and sections of an interview or interview transcript and you're looking for the I statements and it comes from a method called a feminist method, voice centered relational method, and it's part of that. So, and then it's a way of presenting your data um, through poets, poems that a researcher has developed from these mm. I statements or me statements or we statements. So, yeah. So, yeah, oh, it's a bit I love different. That. I absolutely <laughs> love it. It sounds really fascinating. And, and I think for me, our, the highlight of the week sort of about to come because and, and Claire and I are actually sort of fortunate that we're going to be spending time together this weekend doing a writing retreat and just um, spending time immersing ourselves in some of the things that we would like to do to, to kind of things that you end up putting on the back burner that we can actually have centre stage and, and also connecting together so I'm really looking forward to sharing that time with you thank I'm you too. for sharing those so um, as usual, um, Claire and Becky are going to be sharing with us some of their insights from their practice and research and all about personalised care this evening. But before we move on to welcoming Becky, it's, we've just got a short film to show you, just um, giving some insights into the Matflix series that are available to support universities. So we'll just watch that film and then I'll introduce Becky and we'll get started with the evening. Thank you. This is a big day for us at Matflix. We have finally cleared all the hurdles to get on to Open Athens for access in universities, trusts, companies, and anybody else that uses those kinds of systems. So uh, if you're at university, if you're a teacher, if you're a student, then you can get uh, Matflix onto your Open Athens system and begin to access everything. We've published over a thousand maternity and midwifery videos over the past few years and they've been watched in over 180 countries. Um, but everyone fed back that searching through them and trying to pull them together into presentations was something they would like us to do and to improve the cataloging. So we're now launching expert box sets and we'll be giving access to people through open access 
to the huge uh, archive of a thousand of some of the best presentations from uh, maternity experts around the world. The thing about these box sets is that they allow you to find presentations by topic. Uh, they include invaluable research indexes and workbooks and they provide you with video content you know you can trust. Uh, besides Sue McDonald's work in curating the original programs and recordings, the box sets have been edited by uh, Jenny Hall, uh, former editor at The Practicing Midwife, and somebody that many educators will know from her time in Bournemouth. Uh, it also saves time and money for educators and employers. It's from trusted experts, trusted selections that are manageable size, size, ideal for training and study, and you can use them, and we found people using them to rehearse for applying for jobs, so and good for reflective learning. And we already have a whole string of box sets out, and we'll be releasing a new one almost every week through the rest of this year. So the new institutional subscriptions for universities uh, and trusts are on Open Athens now. There's three levels of subscription, one just for students, one for students and staff who want to use it in teaching, want to use clips, and also want to point students towards it for the flipped classroom. And there's also institution-wide subscriptions, so not just for maternity and midwifery students, but for all those uh, medical students, social science students, people doing women's studies, for whom what's happening in maternity and midwifery is really important. So this is a big step up for Matflix. It's a big new service. It helps fund the maternity and midwifery hour and the festivals and keep those bits free. So I hope you'll look into it and I hope you can champion it with your institutions. Um, and again, a big thanks to Sue McDonald and to Jenny Hall for all their curating and editorial work. Oh, those um, video box sets look fantastic. And uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Becky Westbury, who is a community midwife team leader from the Howarvar University Health Board in Wales and is, a pas is passionate about supporting choice, home birth and normality. And she's got experience as a research midwife and has completed her MSc in professional midwifery practice with a dissertation comprising of research exploring midwives' attitudes towards birth outside the guidelines. Becky also works as a midwifery lecturer for Swansea University, where she's inspired by supporting student midwives to grow, learn and develop. And she thoroughly enjoys her role in practice, achieving excellent continuity with her caseload and regularly supports home births whilst leading a team of exceptional community midwives. Wow, what a busy person. <laughs> and it's so wonderful that you've made time to be with us tonight to talk about your work and insights. So over to you, Becky, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Anna. So I'll just get my, um, my slides shared. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really wonderful to be here and I'm really, um, really touched to have been asked actually to join you guys this evening. Um, and what I'm going to be doing this evening is talking about ways in which we've established effective um, partnership working in the area in which I work. Um, so just to give a bit of background then, I'm going to be sharing how we've established um, collaborative working relationships to provide multidisciplinary support and care. Um, for women and birthing people choosing to birth outside of guidelines. And this um, is actually a Practicing Midwife article that I published uh, back last year, along with one of our consultant obstetricians and also a student midwife that was on placement with us at the time. Um, so I feel like that in itself really reflects how collaboratively we work that, we, um, that we've published this together. So just to look then at um, the area in which I work, um, because I'm conscious that some of the listeners may not be um, be aware with our wonderful about our wonderful little unit. So, uh, as a community midwife, I work out of Bronglice Hospital, which is in Aberystwyth in West Wales. So, we have one maternity ward, which is an obstetric unit. It's a birth centre. It's an antenatal ward, postnatal ward, triage, and day assessment, all in one. And we don't have a special care baby unit. Uh, so, for that reason, we have. Um, quite a set criteria as to who we would recommend births in our obstetric unit. 
Our neighbouring obstetric unit within our health board is Glangwilly Hospital in Carmarthen, which is the bottom arrow there on the map. Uh, so they have an obstetric unit with and alongside MLU and they also they do have a special care baby unit and they're situated 46 miles from Bronglais, which is about an hour and 15 um, by road. So our community team, uh, the North Ceredigion team, which I lead, is based in Bronglais maternity unit and our office is actually on the maternity ward. Um, so I just thought I'd share our stats poster from last year. We put these out every month for the women and birthing people and their families, and they really love seeing um, the months in which their babies were born. So this was our poster for uh, last year in its entirety. So you can see that we had 469 births altogether. So we are a very little unit, but I think we're a very fantastic unit um, along with that. So how have we um, established then our effective partnership working? So we try to work really collaboratively. We are quite a small team. Um, so perhaps this lends itself to being able to work more collaboratively. We have three consultant obstetricians. We have eight community midwives in our team. And our team, because of the geographical challenges that we face in Mid Wales, we don't provide or receive cross cover from any other teams. So our team of eight midwives, there's two of us on call every night, and we always then work with one of our colleagues if we're at a birth. The obstetric unit is staffed by 22 hospital midwives, um, and there is one midwife who works in the antenatal clinic. So a pretty small team with you know small numbers there um, which means that we have got to know each other really well as a team we all work together really frequently and it has lent, it's lent itself pretty well to um, establishing a really collaborative way of working. Our community team uh, is really passionate about continuity of care antenatally and postnatally we don't provide intrapartum um, continuity um, we obviously support women from our team to um, have home births but if women birth on the unit, they're cared for by hospital midwives. We recently had an audit of uh, the continuity of our team comparing against the, the, um, the aim of uh, women and birthing people seeing a maximum of two midwives antenatally and postnatally. And our team were actually really chuffed to score 100% in that audit. So continuity is something that's really important to us. And I think it's really helped us again in the, uh, the partnership working with um, women and birthing people and multidisciplinary team. So we have really early discussions with women and birthing people about place of birth. Everybody receives the birthplace decisions leaflet at their booking appointment at around eight weeks. And that highlights to them um, that although they may have a recommended place of birth based on their individual circumstances, they have a choice of place of birth. And those are all outlined in this leaflet, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of. We then also complete a birth preferences discussion with everybody at around 36 weeks. And this is the performa that we use for that. This is just the first page. And this, again, gives women and birthing people the opportunity to really think about where they want to have their baby. Uh, it gives us then chance to support them to make um, plans to receive information and to perhaps access additional care if necessary um, or indicated. So it really gives them a chance to think about the kind of birth that they want, and it gives us opportunity to be able to support them in that. So as we have discussions with everybody about place of birth, um, our home birth rate then is, is quite high because we make everybody aware that they have a choice. Prior to um, three out of the eight of us joining the team um, back in 2018, the team unfortunately didn't have brilliant staffing and weren't able to actively promote the home birth service. But since the staffing improved, um, we have actively promoted the home birth service. Um, being quite a small community then, word of mouth has spread amongst women and families about home birth. And our home birth rate has incre increased. Um, last year it was 6.1%, which we were absolutely over the moon with. Um, but of course, where we are promoting um, choice in terms of place of birth, our home birth rate has gone up not only for um, women and birthing people who are under midwifery led care, but also for those under obstetric led care um, and are choosing to birth outside of guidelines. So we recognise then that, you know, we really needed to ensure that we were providing adequate support and working in partnership to support families wanting to birth outside of guidelines. Uh, so another way in which we do this then is regular conversations with all different members of the team 
And I think having our community midwives office based on the maternity ward has helped to no end with this. We're regularly speaking to the hospital based midwives. We're regularly seeing the obstetricians um, and it's just really helped to create, um, create a rapport and also an effective working relationship. We have regular email contact um, with our consultant obstetricians. They're extremely receptive to us emailing them for a, with a quick question or an opinion on something, and they're really responsive at getting back to us, um, which means that um, by having that approachable nature, we are able to, um, to put feelers out as to care plans early on rather than waiting for an appointment um, to come through so we can get the ball rolling quite early. And all of these things have helped us to establish effective and trusting working relationships. So our team of community, midwife uh, community midwives has a real passion for supporting informed choice. We, as I said, we discuss place of birth with everybody on our caseload, but we also, um, because of COVID, uh, have moved to Microsoft Teams antenatal education that really looks at um, letting women and birthing people know that they have a choice and that we will support them in making different choices. And we like to give them you know, all the different information about uh, different places of birth, different choices they can make during labour and birth. We also then facilitate a home birth evening on Teams where we will discuss um, facts and figures surrounding home births. And we'll also invite families who've birthed their babies at home with us to come and join the meeting quickly, share their experience, answer any questions. And we also try as a team to all log in, even if it's just for five minutes to say a quick hello, so that women and birthing people will be um, will be familiar faces um, to them, that we won't be um, attending their birth without them knowing us. We also are very welcomed to attend um, obstetric-led antenatal clinics in Bronglice. So um, if we have somebody on our caseload who um, we think is... Uh, considering birthing outside of guidelines as their named midwife we will attend their antenatal clinic appointment with them just to pre you know, present a united front to the woman or birthing person but also then because we can sit with them along with the obstetrician and make a plan of care and we all know what we're contributing to it we are able to be on the same page and um, it's evaluated really well with women they you know they say they feel really supported by us as a team approach um, and that, that's what we're aiming for, isn't it? We share our care plans widely then with anybody uh, who chooses to birth outside of guidelines. We compile, uh, we compile an SBAR. So our consultant midwife in Hawalda has provided us as community midwives with templates that we can use to have birth choices discussions with women and birthing people. Um, and the templates are for some of the perhaps more commonly encountered um, outside of guidelines requests such as a vaginal birth after cesarean outside of an obstetric unit or a woman with a raised BMI wishing to birth outside an obstetric unit, previous PPH. There's multiple ones that we've got um, and it enables us then to have the information that we need to discuss um, readily available so that we can give women and birthing people the information that they need to make an informed choice. We have an SBAR folder on the maternity ward where the hospital midwives can quickly access the information that they need um, if those women and birthing people are coming into the unit for any reason. And we have really regular email communication in regards to any plans that we're making. So student midwives that are on placement with us then um, have said that they felt really fortunate to have experiences of being involved in working in this way. So these are our home birth selfies that we take for our team um, and we share them on Twitter with the hashtag home birth just happened, which we'd picked up on from another team. We're using it. Um, student midwives in Wales wear purple. So you can see um, the student midwives pictured here with us at births and the student midwives have said, um, that, you know, that they found it really valuable to be able to be involved in the care planning to such an extent, attending the obstetric clinics as well. And then following through the care, doing the birth plans, and then if they were really lucky, attending the births as well. Another thing that we found really beneficial is to feed back on outcomes. So if a consultant obstetrician has supported us to plan um, a home birth or an MLU birth outside of guidelines, we'll let that obstetrician know how the birth went, what the outcome was, and how the woman felt about the experience. 
Um, this picture on the right here is of the coffee pot, the cafetiere that we've got on the maternity ward, because lots of the conversations, lots of these conversa conversations take place um, over coffee in the coffee room that we all share on the maternity ward. Um, and I feel really lucky that we are able to all share that space and um, benefit from these informal conversations that take place. We're also really proactive um, in our area with regards to learning opportunities. We regularly reflect as a team um, about care plans, about births that we've attended, and um, we, you know we're not afraid to approach each other and say, "Oh, you know, what do you think about this? Would you involve this person for this plan?" Um, so we are really proactive um, and reflective as a team in terms of learning opportunities. We've developed a book lending library for, um, for colleagues where we've brought in books that we found um, beneficial to our learning and we've got those then that um, we can lend to colleagues. We've also got a very small collection of books um, that we were fortunate to have donated by a family who birthed with us um, that we can actually lend out to women and families to read. Um, books such as those by Sarah Wickham about inducing labour um, in your own time. Um, we've got a lot from her series. And we've also got some of the Your Birth books by Emma Mills and Louise Taylor with positive stories. So we lend those out to families and they really appreciate that. Um, they feel that we're really investing then in their choices and supporting them to make informed decisions. We also, as a team then, are really proactive about attending additional training and courses. Um, I'm a learning rep for the RCM for our area and um, the Bronglice team are really, um, really proactive in attending the training that's put on um, by the RCM and by, from external sources as well. Um, so I just thought I'd share some feedback then from women and birthing people who our team have supported to make care plans outside of guidelines. So um, women felt that uh, we were letting them give birth to their own babies um, they felt safe and strong. Um, one woman says that the obstetrician said to her at 36 weeks, well, we hope not to see you again. Um, and she felt free to trust her body, which was everything she'd hoped for. These pictures on the right then I've shared um, with the uh, family's very kind permission. So the Instagram post that's been screenshot here was um, the first home birth that this family had with us after having a previous cesarean. Um, and the woman has captioned it as the best day of her life. Um, the rest of the feedback is there for you to read, but it was just really lovely. And then the two pictures on the right are from her second home birth that she had with us just last year. Um, and she, you know, she's given some really kind, amazing feedback about how well supported she felt by the midwives and obstetricians as a team um, in her choices. So just to finish off then with some reflections from other members of the team, which are outlined in the Practicing Midwife article that I mentioned. So our consultant obstetrician that contributed um, said that he really valued the integrated way that we work, um, that he finds the closely shared care model a very satisfying way of working, and um, that he's noticed that since we've um, established this more collaborative way of working, that women and birthing people feel more respected as individuals as opposed to a statistic. And then Malin, our student midwife who contributed, um, felt that we were a really approachable team to work with and she felt she could really notice the good working relationships that we had. And she also really valued the continuity that she was able to experience during her placement and felt that that really, um, really contributed to her, um, to her experience. So that's my presentation. I really hope um, you guys have enjoyed learning a little bit about how we work in what I think is a brilliant unit. Um, we do actually have some jobs available at the moment. Um, so if anybody's interested in coming to join our brilliant team, um, then please get in touch with me. I think my Twitter was at the start of the presentation. Um, but yeah, I would really love to hear from anyone with any questions or anything at all. Thank you. Uh wonderful thank you so much Becky what a fantastic presentation sharing insights into the you know the essential way that you work which is in collaboration which to me it sounds like a collaboration between the people that you care for the women and people that and families that you serve but also the wider team and how you support each other working collaboratively across a, a, a wide geographical area as well like just an incredible place and you know, I think it was you, Claire, wasn't it, that was saying that you'd love to work there if you hadn't just, you know, got your dream job. <laughs> it would have also been such an amazing uh, way of working. And 
yeah, I just think it was wonderful to listen and hear and 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 just feel that sense of community leaping out from the screen at the work that you you're achieving. And having been a continuity midwife myself in my first job when I qualified, I just know the rich experience that comes from that but that key collaborative approach that you that you build in that model of care as well really allows to get so much job satisfaction and it's lovely to hear that from the obstetric colleagues and the students that are learning with you as well and obviously the family um, experience which just makes everything worthwhile so thank you and and we you know for people watching if you've got any questions please please share them for Becky and we'll look at those after we've heard from Dr. Claire Feely. So thanks, Becky. You can have a little relax now and Thank enjoy you. Claire's presentation. So Claire, <laughs> it's so wonderful um, to welcome you uh, to speak again. I know it's been quite recent that you've shared your insights from your research so it's really wonderful that you can come back and and share more and more insights about working together in a for personalized care and um, so I'd just like to tell people a little bit about you so Dr Claire Feely is a lecturer of midwifery at King's College London and congratulations on that new position it's wonderful and you you'll have an emphasis in that role on research which I think is really wonderful and important and as an experienced clinical midwife, educator and researcher, Claire specialises in normal birth across the risk spectrum, water immersion, human rights frameworks, midwifery practice, skills and competence, all within this important socio-cultural political lens. And Claire's personal research has included free birthing, midwives supporting out of guidelines, normal birth care, with numerous collaborations in a wider range of topic areas, such as assisted vaginal birth, experiences of pharmacological, non-pharmacological pain relief methods, water immersion outcomes, and experiences and parent psychosocial needs during neonatal unit care, and patient and public involvement during innovation and continuity of care implementations. Central to all of Claire's work it is education, research and practices, the improvement of maternity service delivery to meet the needs of all that, that use those services that we provide care to. So it's a real honour to have you here to, to share this evening with Becky. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing about your work and research. So thanks, Claire. You can share your screen. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, and me and Becky, we've had lots of conversations and spent a lot of time together talking about this stuff, but I actually haven't heard a presentation from Becky specifically. Um, I knew it was a wonderful setup, but I have to say my heart was absolutely singing in that presentation. So I'm sure it resonated um, with other people as well. I'm going to share my screen now, but make sure I've got audio. If I say it out loud, it means I remember these things. Two seconds. Right. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Anna. And uh, many of you would have heard me talk just recently with the wonderful um, Anna Marie Maidley, um, sharing our research, research insights. So this is kind of a development and or building on that. Um, and I wanted, I saw this really cute picture and I thought, actually, this is great. Um, this really sums up this idea of working together, that we all need to be working together to support women and birthing people's experiences of maternity care and one that is personalised to the individual. But in order to do that, and definitely Becky's given us the, the everyday insights of what that actually looks like, you know, having a cup of tea, sharing office spaces, sharing environments, because what we need to do in order to um, fulfill the needs of people in our care, we need to address the needs of the professionals so we can all authentically support that individualised safe care. And this, what I'm talking about tonight is, was also published in the Practicing Midwife and it's there this month. Um, and there's the citation there. And I think someone's going to pop the link into the chat uh, so you can link straight to it. So, you know, I can, there's more details in there. 
Of course, and I won't spend too much time on this because we all know this, we know choices matter and we know that women and birthing people deserve and should expect to maintain control, dignity, respect and bodily autonomy. And this is all linked to the human rights and childbirth framework. And all of this is linked to safe and personalised care. But we know we are living in a very complex cultural uh, arena, if you like, where we know choice and autonomy. We've got a very strong rhetoric for that. We've got the best legislation in the world, I would argue. We've got some of the best policy in the world. But we know on the ground and in reality, actually delivering and fulfilling a truly autonomous agenda can be very challenging. And this can be a combination of, of reasons, wider discourses around medicalization, institutionalization, perhaps more so than medicalization. We've got risk averse litigation and um, issues around, um, or challenges, should I say, with government governance, not governments, governance. And of course, at the simultaneously, we've got issues for those people who do want extra. Uh, medical care, me medical interventions, they also find it challenging to get their needs met. And as I've said before, we also, within this complex area, midwives, we're not a homogenous group. Obstetricians are not a homogenous group. No professional group is homogenous. And of course, midwives, um, how they view and their philosophy and their values will influence how they deliver their care in terms of personalization. And as I've said before, in terms of safety, we need to just remember when we're considering out of guidelines, which is kind of always defaults that to the negative, but I call it alternative physiological births, which is a complete mouthful and not very smooth to say. But when we think about uh, out of guidelines, normal birth, we really need to think that safety is, is more than one aspect. It can't just be one aspect. It's holistic. It's biopsychosocial, cultural and spiritual. And most importantly, it, however uncomfortable um, some people's and women's decisions make us, we have to remember that safety is perceived differently by everyone. And it's our jobs and, uh, to ascertain what that individual's perception of safety is. And of course, and especially listening to Becky of how you can cultivate that through trusting relationships. So I just always like to put this caveat in because I know out of guidelines, normal birth can make some professionals feel uncomfortable. But when we look at it in this more broader view, then um, and when we see the person before we see their risk factor, and I'm putting that in inverted commas, then that does change that shifts things. And as you know, you've seen this before, many of you have seen this before, the types of decisions that the midwives in my PhD study were involved with. And you've got, you know, either women with healthy pregnancies, but declining aspects of care, like uh, care, like examinations or post dates inductions, or you've got women or birthing people with more complicated pregnancy, perhaps obstetric risk factors or medical um, issues. But I always like to put an acknowledgement here, because as much as um, I've spent a lot of time immersed in the literature, in the research and carrying out the research, particularly for women who adopted to free birth you know, prior to this particular study, I think it's also really important to appreciate and for me to fully acknowledge the challenges that midwives face when someone does opt outside the guidelines. While many of the midwives in my study, PhD study, did face pressures, and I shared that with you last time, they personally and act proactively supported these choices. So their philosophy and skills were aligned to those decisions. And I appreciate that isn't the same for everyone. And also, I know that depending where you work and who you work with and the service you work within, a request outside of guidelines might be causing and may cause all sorts of worries and fears. Sometimes women making these choices can stir feelings of uh, concern and anxiety. And sometimes we can catastrophize worrying about, um, you know, jumping to the adverse outcome and risk, uh, risk of litigation. And this is particularly worrying, particularly frightening if you haven't experienced 
um, a, that particular type of birth choice if you've not been involved in the care. And as we, again, you know, linking back to Becky's presentation, thinking about the experience, embodied experience that her and her colleagues are building up over time as they support true personalised care. But if it's the first time you've come across perhaps someone wanting a vaginal birth after cesarean at home, then it's understandable and natural for it to feel somewhat you know, slight concern. Um, and if you're not in a supportive and an enabling environment, then that can actually feel quite threatening uh, for women making some of these decisions. And we know that through the research. I know that from my research that I shared with you last time, that some of you are going to be listening tonight, are going to be working in very challenging work environments and where people and your colleagues don't necessarily support women's full autonomy. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that we all have our own reactions and responses when we are offering truly personalised care. And that is completely normal and natural, but our job is to be able to be self-aware and be able to put those things to one side, of course. But we also need to be in supportive environments, which is where a lot of, uh, a lot of this model has come from. So you've seen this before, many of you have seen this before, we know how the midwives delivered the personalised care for alternative physiological births. And broadly, you can see active support, relational trust in care, ongoing discussions, finding out what a person's non-negotiables were, care planning, liaising with the multidisciplinary team as appropriate. But depending where the midwives worked, this could be a really straightforward process or a super challenging process requiring lots of emotional or mental labour. And in my study, the midwives worked in a range of environments where for some, this care was the absolute norm and for others, it was delivering this care was wrought with difficulties and challenges. But in my last talk where I presented uh, the second analysis that explored the midwives experiences of delivering their care and very much talked about their workplace environments and how much that influenced how the midwives were able to get on with the job and certainly how they felt and experienced delivering personalised care. But on reflection from that last presentation, I realised I did focus too much on the negative. And as you can see from this little um, diagram here, there was much more to it. Um, there was much more rich stories beyond the stories of distress. And I just wanted to counterbalance that and share with you just briefly um, something from the stories of fulfillment before moving on to the model itself, because it is really important to learn from what works and where it's working well. And we've already had this inspirational uh, presentation from Becky, and this hopefully reinforces that. So in the study of 45 midwives, 21, and how inspiring and optimistic does that make us, 21 out of the 45 actually uh, had what how I captured these stories of fulfillment. And for some, and I remember last time I talked about very much it was the workplace that mediated how midwives felt and experienced their practice. So in the stories of fulfillment, for some of the midwives, this related to the sense of the ordinary, where their midwife uh, practice was marked by a lack of conflict, aminosity or distress. Rather, they were just simply able to get on with the job. And then that was because the midwives were in supportive working environments where women's alternative choices were mostly accepted and midwives practice was supported from across the organisation. And then for other midwives, their narratives related to a sense of camaraderie between themselves in these small relational teams and to the women and themselves in this team. So you have these stories of togetherness. And then finally, some of the other part participants expre expressed a feeling of the sublime. And then through counts of love or tenderness, achievement and reverence, and in these situations, the organisational culture and issues faded away into the background. They became dissented so that the mother midwife, the family midwife relationship was the central focus. And in a minute, I'll press play. And this is uh, one of the quotes from my study. And you can hear in the voiceover the joy and beauty of facilitating 
facilitating this family's birth. And a side note for context that this midwife had cared for this family over several pregnancies and not all of them were happy outcomes. So this pregnancy, this birth was made all the more meaningful as the midwife journeyed wholeheartedly with the family, giving everything she could to make it the best experience possible. And I think I've clicked the right box. So hopefully you can hear this. So just to counterbalance the perhaps more negative from the last presentation. So when we're looking across, the, when I was looking across the data, data set and I did these three different analyses, although one's yet to be published, the LN have to ask the question of so what? What does this mean for or practice beyond sharing the important stories and lived experience of the midwives. And of course, that is a worthy endeavor and I'm really glad to have shared what I have shared so far. But in order to you know, support practice, what I wanted to do was think about this, so what? So this asset model was developed. And it's a tool that can be used for both us as individual practitioners to consider our needs everyday needs and perhaps consider where our gaps are and how we can fulfill those gaps. But it is also a model that can be used by organisations to consider whether they, whether they have the right components in place to ensure midwives are enabled and supported to deliver authentic, authentically personalised care. And we know it's a key policy driver at the moment, so perhaps this could possibly help. So this model, a play on the word asset, is to show that midwives are the asset for women and birthing people to get their needs met. And it also situates what midwives need from an individual level across to an organisational level. And as you can see from these words here. And the idea here is that while individual midwives, yes, make a big difference to women's experiences of care, it is essential that personalised care out of guidelines care is viewed as a collective responsibility whereby the service is able to meet the needs of the women by supporting the midwives and, of course, obstetricians and wider MDT to deliver the care that they are trained to do. So I'm just briefly going to go through two aspects of this because I think they're particularly pertinent at the moment. And if we think about skills and skill development, as is something midwives need. So it's absolutely essential. And for the midwives in this study, they shared the extensive experience they had in supporting physiological labour and birth. They had expertise and which created the competence to apply those skills to more complex alternative birthing decisions or situations. So when facing a complex alternative birthing decision, such as twins in water, they referred back to their knowledge, knowledge of anatomy and physiology and applied it to the current situation. And so working through a range of possible scenarios, practical simulations, the midwives demonstrated careful planning and contingency planning based on enhancing the physiology. Such expertise was gained from actively seeking opportunities, either as a student or once qualified. So they may have asked for specific mentoring or requesting to work at a birth centre or joining a home birth or caseloading team. For others, they just happened to be in the right place at the right time. They, someone took them under their wing and shared with them and helped them develop these skills. 
So for safe care, we need to think about um, it cannot be the individual burden to get these skills. It must be supported from a systems approach uh, to cultivate and develop and enhance and keep creating the opportunities for the skills. And this is, of course, links to CPD. And it's, the, it's got to be the role of the organisation to help midwives access opportunities for ongoing skill development in, phys in physiological births. Trust must ensure that these training needs and development are met for midwives working in all areas of clinical practice, particularly with the continuity rollout. And lots of midwives are moving from their usual place of work. This is an ideal opportunity to upskill and reskill the workforce as is going on already. And we can see a great example by Dr. Sean Walker, what she's doing around breech birth gives us all optimism to demonstrate how where skills have been lost, we not only can we regain those skills, but we can actually improve on what we were doing before. And then finally, I just wanted to focus, this is probably one of the most important parts of the model when we think about we've got to keep a systems approach in mind yes individual midwives we do have a responsibility for our own learning and education but we also need to um, consider where we are in the ecosystem of NHS care so in acknowledging some of the fears around supporting these birth choices this is where the systems approach is vital. And as I've said, we, we do have an individual ethical and moral legal duties in terms of the care that we give, but we also have to address the systemic issues. And as I've said before, some of the participants in my study did work in hostile environments where gem the general culture is unsupportive of midwifery and women's autonomy, and there was negative poor working relationships. So if, a midwife is working as a lone ranger, delivering authentic woman-centered care that women are asking for, this is completely unsustainable and leads to distress and burnout, which we know is one of the leading factors in why midwives leave the profession. But on the flip reverse of that, where participants worked in these supportive environments, where the organizational values and culture created the optimal environment for midwives to deliver women-centred care, where these choices, where women having a choice, as we saw in Becky's, women having a choice was normalised. It was everyday practice. And this creates that lovely virtuous cycle, positive cultures, which go beyond an individual midwife or an individual team. And it actually then spreads out or comes in from the wider organisation. And this is important because then it shifts the burden of delivering women-centred care from a, just an individual doing it and rather it becomes a shared vision and a collective responsibility across an organisation. And this is where values um, of women's autonomy over organisational needs and trust in midwives to deliver care are crucial. So midwives need support that is accessible, timely and restorative. For my study, sometimes that was as simple as calling a senior or consultant midwife for reassurance that the care plan was appropriate. Sometimes it was just a brainstorm a situation which may have become unexpectedly complex. So having a senior midwife on call, for example, quick phone call to sort through something. Sometimes it, it meant having a structured multidisciplinary team meeting with professionals across the different sectors to come together and create a care plan, but where that's centred on the woman or birthing person's needs. And then simultaneously, that helped ensure that components of safety were factored, factored in. So everyone brought their strengths, skill sets, areas of expertise, and really had a conversation and checked in uh, with each other. Have we thought about this properly? Have we thought about that properly? But all the while centering the woman's as uh, their decision as centre and for, for first and foremost. And we know that um, where the multidisciplinary team was approachable, just again, as Becky has talked about, and was available and easily available for supportive, constructive discussions, that provided another robust layer of support and enhances the psychological safety for midwives, which of course enhances the safety for women families. Teams that work well together to deliver the most optimal outcomes. 
And then for others, support came from uh, debriefing through challenging episodes, which, if carried out in an open learning culture, enhance the midwives' well-being, their clinical skills and their practice. And in other areas, it was support was cultivated through formalised care plans, care planning pro formas, guidelines. And for most of the midwives, that was viewed as supportive mechanisms. But a fundamental message here is that midwives need to know that they have the support of the organisation as a whole, from the managers to the heads of midwifery, to their MDT, to their immediate colleagues. Having organisational support and psychologically safe working environments reduces the potential for distress and burnout, which absolutely mirrors the literature that we already know about. And so fundamentally, this model supports the ongoing message that a systems approach to um, maternity care is essential to improve both safety and dignified respect for maternity care for women and birthing people. Staff need open and enabling and psychologically safe working environments. And we all need to work together to provide the safe, personalised care. And just finally, I just want to say thank you. Remember, each and every one of you make a difference. Every interaction can lift women up to feel empowered by, about their birth choices. And the love and care you bring into your practice, even when you're facing your own concerns and challenges, goes such a huge way to readdressing the imbalances with the maternity care. So for that, I thank you. And thank you so much. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Claire. Wow, just such an incredible insight and to hear voices from the public um, and to bring those insights to life in the way that midwives require support and for themselves and the individual ways they can work to strengthen their practice through the asset model, but also as a system. And I think that collaborative and organisational level support is so important. And just remembering that we're part of that, we make up the organisation, we are the organisation. And so building these relationships, not just with the families that we care for, but with each other and reaching out to each other and sharing best practice is really, for me, what's been so wonderful about this particular midwifery hour is listening to you both. This is such an amazing way of sharing what you're doing in your local area or research practice which is bringing to life things that will be able to be shared with all. And I think the, the joy of research is that it allows us to shine a light and elevate midwifery knowledge and knowledge from practice to help others in making decisions. And um, that's just, it's just been such an informative evening. Thank you so much to you both. We've got a few minutes left this evening and there have been some questions and comments coming through. So I just wondered if I could spend a moment now talking to you both and sort of asking and opening up some insights. So we've got um, to start with, there was a, a comment from Alex, a student midwife that's joining us and just wanted to say something to Becky. So this came through just after you were talking, Becky, that she just wanted to ask, or, or they wanted to ask, this integrative role across the multidisciplinary team seems like it should be nationally implemented. How can we promote this in environments where there is more separation of all clinicians on an obstetric unit, for example? Mm, yeah, and I, I do think this is where we're very fortunate with the, the format and the structure of our unit. Um, certainly from when I worked in, um, in a bigger unit down in South Wales, um, I made a point as a community midwife of, of going and introducing myself to the obstetricians that women and birthing people on my caseload were under. Um, and I felt then that if I or when I emailed them, they, they knew who I were, uh, knew who I was. Um, hopefully they'd remember me. Um, and I suppose as well, um, potentially the midwives who work on the labour ward um, have more contact with the obstetricians. But as community midwives who are the ones um, undertaking the care planning may not have that contact. Um, so I guess just trying to, um, if possible, pop into the unit, if you can, as a community midwife. Um, obviously, I'm, I am coming at it from a community stance, but um, that, that's what worked for me when I worked in a bigger unit. Oh, thank you. That's really helpful advice. Thank you. And actually, Claire, there was an, a comment from the same person for you, just to thank you for, the, for your work on alternative 
physiological birthing. It's provided inspiration for all their cohort at the university who must be joining in to hear from you tonight. Um, I just wanted to also share a, a question about, just for both of you really, I think this is something from um, Haya Ajaluni, who's watching from Jordan. And it's actually a question about uh, student midwives and you know how welcomed they are in birthing environments and you know maybe how they can also adopt the asset model so I thought maybe Becky if you could talk about how students are integrated into your team specifically and and especially in the presence of women and birthing people and then maybe Claire would you be able to talk a little bit about how the asset model could be used by students too I'll start with you, Becky, please. Yeah, so when students are placed with our team, they're allocated a practice supervisor who they try to work with most of the time. Um, and I think because our team achieves such great continuity antenatally, um, the student midwives have the opportunity, if they work with the same midwife, to see the same families repeatedly. Um, and that's evaluated really well, not just with the students, but with the families themselves. Mm. Um, we, we collect feedback from um, everyone who uses our service um, and a lot of them actually comment on a name student midwife specifically that they've seen multiple times, um, which is really lovely. Um, I think as well, then, when it comes to welcoming student midwives into um, birthing environments, if um, families have seen student midwives antenatally um, and had a good experience, then, you know, they recognise that actually they can be really valuable to their care um, and are perhaps, you know, more receptive and happier to have student midwives involved. Oh, thank you, Becky. That's really useful. So continuity all around makes a difference to that learning environment and experience for families as well. So that's wonderful. And Claire, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that asset model and how maybe it can be used during your training to think about strengthening that sort of so that students can use it for their own development. Sure. Can I just say something about Becky's service yes, collecting course. feedback? Great. Um, if, if I can, any of the other midwives um, who are in service at the moment, I really encourage you to do what they're doing um, because it's just such an important piece of data. And that's all very formal to say that. But you can go share that with your colleagues who perhaps aren't so comfortable. And you can start this other virtuous cycle of promoting um, positive practice. And that's something that's actually in my article. Coming back to students. It's, it can be a framework because you're not going to be there straight away, but you might use it as a tool to reflect in the first instance of and, and looking at it across all those different bullet points, that information of where your values are aligned with it, because not every person is going to be fully aligned with this. We have to get behind it because personalised care is not going anywhere, but you might be a bit further away or closer to that in terms of your values. Then you can use it and actually identify. So you might be, say, coming into your third year and think, hang on a minute. I've only ever supported women in semi-recumbent or lithotomy. That's probably, well, certainly is a big gap in my, my knowledge and understanding. How can I then navigate and talk to um, the people I'm working with to help me get that experience in at least supporting someone in a different position, lateral, all fours, water, etc. COVID has put some of those access to other units a bit on hold, but hopefully over the next year or so that might change again. So getting access to community settings is essential in mm -hmm. terms of building up your skills. When you start going to interview, all right, you are interviewing those trusts as much as they're interviewing you. You can, if you align with this tool and the things that I've put in there, you can you can use that tool. Does, does this look like the place that's going to support me, nurture me to live that, you know, be the midwife I want to be? So I think that's probably. I'll finish there on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing to give it give good advice about you know, seeking out the places that you want to work that are going to give you that support and nurture you is a really important thing. And I think it is the thing that we look for when we are looking for our, our jobs um, and career, career pathways. I think that's really good tips. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and looking out for opportunities for learning. 
you know, it was really, that's definitely sort of came out from your presentation, the importance of that and taking that responsibility for our practice development personally, as well as being supported to do that in practice as well. So there was, there are a few other comments that it'd be lovely if you get a chance to, to jump on and have a look back through some. Um, but I think we've come to the end of our time together now. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you again to you both for being with us and sharing your insights. And thank you for giving us all an opportunity to think about what personalised midwifery and maternity care means and looks like with some real tangible ex examples and ways of using evidence and research to make a difference and, and elevate issues and raise voices. So thank you to you both for, for coming here tonight. And thank you to the Maternity and Midwifery Forum and Midwifery Hour for providing this little light in the dark of the night for us here in the UK. And I hope that everybody listening has enjoyed um, being with us this evening and good luck to everybody. So look out for the links that we'll share for the articles that have been mentioned. And um, yeah, reach out and connect to us on social media. We'll look forward to answering other questions. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The Maternity and Midwifery Forum brings you Matflix, video streaming from maternity experts. All your CPD and revalidation needs met in one place. Our expertly curated box sets are the perfect way to engage with the latest thinking issue by issue. They make revalidation easy and are the perfect accompaniment to any project or university coursework. In addition to video from expert speakers across maternity and midwifery, there is easily accessible research and links to the latest government policy documents. Our reflective questions at the end are the perfect primer for your revalidation. In the same way the Maternity and Midwifery Forum provides certificates to show that you have attended these festivals, we can provide certificates for those who have consumed the content of a box set and submitted their written answers to the reflective questions provided by our curator, Dr Jenny Hall. Midwives, maternity professionals and students, do not miss out. Subscribe to Matflix today. Box sets are now available via Open Athens and other international federated access with library institutional subscriptions packages starting from £1,500 a year. Individual subscriptions are also available at £8.99 a month and just £4.99 a month for students. Check out the box sets at www.matflix.co.uk